Now we've been involved in a study of the deity of Christ, and although we kind of started the study talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses because their core doctrine, regardless of all the other doctrines that they advocate, the core key doctrine that shows that this cannot be legitimate is their denial of the deity of Christ. And so we've really turned this into a study of that. We spent considerable time playing off of Exodus 3.14, going to the New Testament and seeing how very many times Jesus uses this expression, I am, and assigns it to himself. Like, for example, when he was on the sea there and it was tumultuous. 
and the disciples thought he was walking on the water and they thought it was a ghost. They must have been scared out of their wits. And as he got close enough for them to hear him, he said, fear not, I am. Just astounding how often the Bible equates the I am at the burning bush of Exodus 3 with Jesus. And then we move to the question of this divine name that's used over and over and over in the Old Testament and and which the Jehovah's Witnesses have taken from Isaiah 40 as their name. They believe that passage is the passage that justifies them identifying themselves in that way. And there is no way they would ever associate the divine name. (coughs) Remember Yahweh, or the American Standard rendered it Jehovah in 1901. There's no way they would ever identify Jesus with that, with that term. And yet over and over and over in passage after passage, Old Testament refers to Jehovah, you come to the new. Look, for example, refresh your memory, Psalm 102, where you have this lengthy, in fact, the word Jehovah is used over and over and over. And he comes down in, in Psalm 102, what, verse 25, and says, You, O Lord, there's your divine name, have laid the foundations of the earth from old. And then you go to Hebrews chapter 1, and the Hebrews writer says that God said concerning the Son, you have laid the foundations. How do you get around that? Are they distinct persons? Yes but they so share divinity, essence, that what one does, the other does. That's part of the nature of the concept of the Godhead, the Trinity. You know, Muslims and many others just say, no, that's polytheism. Well, it's not. It's not the polytheism of antiquity and and we see uh, represented over and over in the Bible. There is no comparison with the way the Bible presents itself on the matter of deity. So it's just a matter of uh, understanding that the Bible is the inspired word of God and then go to all these passages and see how that meshes, how it gels and fits together. Even if it's an incomprehensible uh, circumstance, granted. But we've suggested it's not somehow incoherent or contradictory that would discredit the Bible. No, not in any ways. In fact, you could argue this is one of the proofs of the inspiration of the Bible. The way God is presented as one essence and yet three distinct, you know, we use the word persons. That's used historically in Christendom, personalities. Not three gods, just one. Now, by the way, um, somebody pass these out for me real quick. Each one is separately uh, paper clipped. One of those is a chart on this point, the I am. And then uh, I've already given you the chart on uh, occurrences of Jehovah in the Old Testament applying to Jesus in the New. And now we are turning our attention to this third point, just scattered allusions, Old and New Testament, that prove that Jesus possesses divinity with the Father. He is co-equal with the Godhead, equal with uh, the Holy Spirit as well. You know, Isaiah 9 is a big one. You're, You're familiar with this passage. It's clearly a messianic prophecy uttered by the messianic prophet. I don't know that anybody would question that this is a reference to Jesus. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder, his name will be. And then you have these uh, four Hebrew couplets. Some of our translations, I think, obscure this by inserting commas where they shouldn't. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All of that referring to Jesus Christ. Okay, how in the world can Jesus be referred to as Father 
Isn't the Father distinct from the Son? Well, once again, you have to conclude that their their beings so interpenetrate, they so... um, they're so close to each other. You know, I suggested to you that one, you know, God cannot say or think something that the Holy Spirit or Jesus doesn't think or say simultaneously. It's not like they learn from each other or something. They are one mind. Some of the, uh, those who try to evade the uh, force of this everlasting Father say, well, the word Father is used in in this passage, uh, you know, in the sense of um, the idiom would be something like he's the, uh, you know, the father of, of uh, all wars, something like that. Okay, but what is this saying? The word everlasting? There's eternality there. In what way does Jesus possess eternality? You could even drop the word father. There's no other being that is everlasting except deity, except God. Not even Satan. Satan's a created being. All the angels created. The only, the only existence prior to the creation of the material universe was deity. And then at what point the angelic host was created, we're not technically I don't think that's a settled question. Some believe that it it occurred just literally right before the physical creation. I don't know. That's been settled in my mind. But um, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of those beings. But they're not divine. Powerful passage. Jesus Christ can be said to possess all of these attributes. Well, that's an affirmation of deity. Here is the Jehovah's Witness 1984 edition, and they don't, they don't tamper with this. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There's a number of places like this where the New World Translation doesn't tamper with these passages that makes me think that either they just haven't got around to it or they thought it would fly without people questioning their own doctrine about this because others they tamper with. So the New Testament repeatedly affirms that belief in Jesus like the Father is necessary I'm moving now to another point. But why is belief mandatory if he's not God? Over and over and over, the New Testament says, you've got to believe in Jesus. All of Christendom believes that that's the case. But are you saying that, well, but that doesn't prove he's God. Well, what are you saying then that um, it matters whether or not we have... uh, Are we supposed to put the same kind of faith that we put in Jesus in the celestial beings? Is our salvation dependent upon, do you, you need to orally confess this before you're baptized. I believe that God made the angels and I believe they exist. I believe in Michael the archangel. You know, that's not a doctrine that's set forth in the Bible that indicates that uh, we will be lost and to suggest that we are to believe in, how about the apostles? That's what's always uh, stunned me about it, Islam. You know, La ilaha illallah. Allah is the, uh, there is no God but Allah. Muhammadun Rasul Allah. You have to say that to be a Muslim. Muhammad is his prophet. So before we're baptized, do we have to affirm that Paul is a bona fide apostle of Christ? I mean, I guess you'd have to believe that in order to know that what he teaches is true, but it's not a prerequisite for determining whether or not you have stepped from being lost into being saved. So faith in deity is prerequisite to salvation and acceptance by God. Well, 
why over and over then do we, are we told we have to place our faith in Jesus? Because he possesses deity. That's Christianity. That's why it's called Christianity. That's why we're called Christians, Christians. Not merely that Jesus uh, died on the cross. Anybody could have died on the cross. What makes Jesus' crucifixion, and a lot did, what makes Jesus' crucifixion unique was he was God in the flesh. And you have to understand that and accept it. And that's really what faith is in the New Testament. It's faith in his person, in who he is, which then emanates into what he's done for us, right? So faith in Christ is an affirmation of deity. Well, you find this all over the place, even in the Old Testament. Therefore, this is the Septuagint version. Therefore, uh, thus saith the Lord, even the Lord, behold, I lay for the foundations of Zion, a costly stone, a choice, a cornerstone, a precious stone for its foundations. And he who believes on him will by no means be ashamed. There's the Messianic prophet making this statement. I quoted in the Septuagint uh, because that's how it's quoted in Peter. Coming to him, Back up in verse 4. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious you also, as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then you keep reading. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. And he quotes Isaiah 28, verse 16. He's just told us now, you've got to believe in Jesus. Why? Well, because God laid a, in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and those who believe on him won't be put to shame. But what about belief in a God the Father? Is that necessary? Oh yeah, Peter had already said that. Speaking of Jesus in 1 Peter 1, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him... Believe in God, there's God the Father, and raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So did Peter say you have to believe in God the Father? Yes. But you have to have the same belief in Jesus. Well, isn't that belief in two different beings, kind of like, you know, different apostles? Or, no. It's belief in God. It's mandatory. To believe in, see, so any religious group that says, uh, you know, Jesus is great. You know, the, the Muslims, the Quran says, Jesus is a prophet of God. Absolutely. He's from God. Well, that's not going to cut it. You have to believe who Jesus is, his person. Muslims believe that's blasphemy. And essentially, the Jehovah's Witness do as well truly tragic and sad <coughs> since all of this, our identity as Christians revolves around that singular concept. Absolutely critical. So belief in God the Father, belief in Jesus are both essential. Why? Because to believe in one is to believe in the other. To believe in either one is to believe in God. God the Father, God the Son, shared divinity. This is all over the place in our Bibles. It's really astounding that uh, any belief system got off the ground emphasizing the idea that Jesus is a God, uh, Michael the Archangel, very prominent in God's scheme of things, but he's not the God. He's not Jehovah. How, how could that fly for so many over a century now and, and attract so many people? Well, you know, one answer is they're not studying their Bibles. Because the Bible has too much of this. Look at Matthew chapter 2. You remember the chief priests and the scribes being correct in their response to King Herod when he asked them where the Christ was to be born. They knew this much of Bible, which they had not distorted. They said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. This is Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. 
Okay, that's in Matthew chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. You go back to uh, Micah 5, and here's the whole quote. You Bethlehem Ephrathah, remember the prophet with precision uses that term because there were two Bethlehems in Palestine. He narrows it down to the one near Jerusalem. Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, there's the tribal lands where it's located, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Notice that's where the quote ends in Matthew chapter 2, but finish what Micah said, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. So the prophet Micah, we know he was referring to Jesus because he's, he's quoted here and all the Jews understood, Micah's a, he's giving a messianic prophecy. They just didn't quote all of it. But Micah said, this one who will come out of Bethlehem, Ephrathah, he's from everlasting. He's existed forever. That can only be said about deity. Christ's eternality. That can be said of no other person or no other thing, no other object. Only deity has existed from eternity. What about Zechariah 13? This took a lot of time to ferret out when I was looking at this for that Job's Witness book. Look at the terminology here. You ought, you ought to look in your Bible at these uh, passages we're looking at to further underscore them in your mind. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion. This is the New King James, so they naturally capitalize places where they're convinced Jesus or deity is being referred to. Uh, remember the all caps shows that this in the, in the Hebrew language is Yahweh, Yehovah, Je, Je, uh, Jehovah. And here's what the Lord says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. Zechariah 13. Well, if we didn't know our New Testament, we might look at that and say, you know, who's the shepherd? Because there are a lot of shepherds in Bible history. But we come to Matthew 26, and Jesus said to them, all of you will be made, he's talking to his apostles, will be made to stumble because of me this night because Zechariah 13, 7 says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock uh, will be scattered. So Jesus applied this prophecy to himself. <coughs> and, you know, we have this uh, metaphor of shepherd used over and over and over. He's the good shepherd. John talks about this a lot. That nails down the concept that it's messianic. But look at this word. I put it in bold. The man who is my companion. Think about that. Here's Jehovah, Lord, Yahweh, saying, this is my companion. Well, aren't we all Christians companions of God or something? So I spent a lot of time looking at this. The lexicons say things like associate, fellow, relation, literally the man of my society. Jehovah was not identifying Jesus merely as an associate in the same way that a prophet or an apostle might be an associate in that he is aiding God in accomplishing God's bidding. Rather, he's declaring that this is one of my fellows with the Holy Spirit. It's always good to uh, you know, go back through the last 2,000 years and see what commentators have said. They can say some crazy things, but when you get a kind of a consensus, you can see a lot of insight, especially from uh, people, uh, not that any human being is not subject to bias, but you go back and see some of these Hebraists, these guys who knew Hebrew so well, you know, they spoke, it's like the back of their hand. They knew the, they're so familiar with the language and its nuances. For example, C.F. Keel, he he and uh, Delich produced that monumental series on the Old Testament. He was a professor of Oriental languages. The expression, man who is my nearest one, that's his rendering, you see, of that term companion, implies much more than unity or community of vocation or that he had to feed the flock like Jehovah. No owner of a flock or lord of a flock would call a hired or purchased shepherd his Ahmed, his companion. This is one who's more than that. 
And so God would not apply this epithet to any godly or ungodly man whom he might have appointed shepherd over a nation, like the kings of Israel. They were God's shepherds. That's not who we're talking about here. The idea of nearest one or fellow involves not only similarity in vocation, but community of physical or spiritual descent, according to which he whom God calls his neighbor cannot be a mere man, but can only be one who participates in the divine nature or is essentially divine. A lot of these fellows make this point. Homer Haley was, you remember, one of our own commentators. He went with the uh, non-institutional element. He was a professor at Abilene Christian and then moved to Florida and participated in the establishment of Florida College. He has a commentary on the Minor Prophets. He comments on this term companion. He is the very essence of God and is identical in purpose with him. Uh, E.B. Pusey was a Regis professor of Hebrew at Oxford for more than 50 years. This guy knew Hebrew. One united by community of nature, manhood, connatural. He who was sold, was pierced, was almighty God. United in nature with himself, although not the manhood of Jesus which suffered, but the Godhead, united with it in one person, was consubstantial with himself. The name might perhaps be most nearly represented by connatural. When then the title is employed of the relation of an individual to God, it is clear that that individual can be no mere man, but must be one united with God by unity of being. So there's a few of the commentators and how they zero in uh, on that word companion. So look in your Bible, maybe mark it, that um, Zechariah 13, 7, uh, in your Bible, mark that word companion and be reminded that this is a, a loaded term that's referring to an individual who shares essence with the Father. So it's an affirmation of Christ's deity. All right, what about Mark chapter 1, verse 24? Don't you find it fascinating that in instance after instance after instance where these demons pop up? You know, that's a whole other discussion, isn't it? Yeah, no question in my mind. Go to our website and type in demons if you want to study it more, but no question in my mind that for a very short period, uh, God enabled these uh, satanic beings to... Uh, even inhabit human bodies on earth in the first century. Turn to, uh, turn back to Zechariah 13 and read the first uh, two or three verses where they're referred to as unclean spirits. Um, what we're talking about here is the same thing that we're talking about when we talk about miracles. Although miracles occurred all through Bible history, they always serve the same purpose. And that's stated over and over in both the Old and the New Testament. And in the New Testament, they're specifically, um, you know, pinpointed over and over as being essential uh, during the period that God's, uh, this new revelation, remember there was like 500 years of inspired silence when Malachi laid down the pen of inspiration. And then suddenly, in about the 50s, we began having these New Testament books coming forth. And they, from A.D. 30 to uh, the commencement of those written records, the gospel's being presented orally by inspired spokesmen. Well, why should we believe them? If you're there listening to these guys in the marketplace or whatever, why should you believe them? Well, because they could authenticate what they were saying by performing a miracle. None of the false prophets could do that. Remember how Simon reacted in Acts 8 when he saw this? These guys really can't do this. I want that. So um, it was temporary. Do these occur now? No. And all those in Christendom that don't have that clear in their study and thinking are susceptible to all sorts of confusion. The miraculous has passed. It does not occur today. There's no reason for it to occur today. At least the Catholics are consistent on that point. They would say Revelation is continuing but I don't even think they understand their, their claim to miracles to have anything to do with confirming God's word. So uh, 
this demon possession was part of this first century period that enabled Jesus in particular, but also the apostles. Paul did some of this to, to show that, that uh, God and Christ and their representatives had power in many areas, like over the created order, but even over these, these demons. Well, that's... Whenever Paul then, Paul in, never claimed that he was doing this of his own power. All of this came from God, from deity, from Jesus, uh, even as Jesus did it several times. So here you have these demons even possessing human bodies, and when Jesus encounters them, they're like, oh man, we know who you are. So there would be strong testimony as to the identity of Jesus. So, for example, in Mark chapter 1, where Jesus visited the synagogue in Capernaum, encountered a man with an unclean spirit, look at what the spirit said. For if people could hear, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Do you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That's an affirmation of deity. We find the same thing in chapter 3, verse 11. He and his disciples withdrew to the sea, followed by a great multitude. And we are told that uh, a number were afflicted with demons, and the unclean spirits, whenever they saw Jesus, fell down before him, so the person in whose body they are residing, and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. This expression here, by the way, is clearly used in the New Testament over and over and over to refer to the deity of Jesus. Are we all sons of God if we're Christians? Yes. Are all human beings sons of God in the sense, sense, that, they, in the sense that they were created uh, by God? Yes. But that's not how this expression is being used when it's used to refer to Jesus, the Son of God. When Jesus said in John, my, my Father and I are one, he meant, I share a relationship with, with uh, the Father that's unlike any human being. We are one in Godhood. That's Mark 3.11. What about chapter 5, verse 7? Remember, they visit the country of the Gadarenes, and he encounters this man that has multiple demons, and here's what they say. What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. All right, so we have uh, chapter 4. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. He laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Demons came out of many crying out. Look what they were saying. You are the Mashiach, the Christos, the Messiah, the Son of God. So you know, whenever people today say, oh, I don't believe Jesus was divine. Man, even the demons believe that. Here are their phrases in those verses I showed you. Son of God, Holy One of God, and the Christ. Notice none of these are referring to him like uh, they would have referred to Paul or some spokesman or prophet. They knew the identity of Jesus. Even a Satan knows who Jesus is. It's not a matter with Satan of, well, I'm not so sure he's God or not. <laughs> no, that's not the case. These demons show a simple awareness of the divine standing of Jesus in the eternal realm. All right, go back to Mark 14. Here is, uh, I've, I'm giving you a minimum of 25. That's how many I put on the sheet. But there's a lot more. There's a lot more that, that are in the book and then that I didn't even get to scattered throughout the Bible. But the interrogation to which Jesus was subjected before the high priest, he brings forward all these false witnesses. And finally, he just presses Jesus. I mean, he just pounds him and says, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? He kept silent. So again, the high priest asked, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? What's he asking him? He's asking him, are you really claiming to be God? Obviously, he's not asking, are you a son of God like the rest of us? 
Are you actually claiming to be this divine figure, the Messiah, that the Old Testament predicted? You're claiming to be him? I am. And by the way, that's ego a me. I am. And you will see the Son of Man, if that's not enough, you'll see him sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. I would suggest to you that that's further affirmation (laughs) of his divinity. In fact, that's exactly how the high priest took it. Tore his clothes. What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What's blasphemous about it? To claim to be God if you're not. That's blasphemous. But what if you are? That's the only basis upon which the Jews could accuse him of blasphemy. His claim was true. Isn't that tragic? Here are these fellows right there looking at God in the flesh and participating and condemning him, unwittingly fulfilling God's ultimate intentions. Astounding. Do you remember uh, at the time of Christ's birth in Luke chapter 2, the angels, now notice these are angels telling us this. There is this day born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What were these angels informing the shepherds concerning the identity of this one who was born in uh, Bethlehem? What was he saying? Christ the Lord? Look at the terms that they use. Christ, Messiah, Savior, and Lord. This is not just like a prophet being born. This is a reference to deity. Let's go back to John 1.1. We spent some time with this when we were talking about... um, I forgot what we were talking about. One of the first sections. You know, hasn't it always uh, awed you that John 1-1 begins like Genesis 1-1? In the beginning. Notice the distinction here, though. (coughs) Moses, when he said that in the beginning, he's talking about the beginning of creation, the beginning of the material realm. So the commencement of of all that's physical. John is starting at that same place and going backwards. He clarifies the fact that deity preceded the invention of time. He precedes time, he precedes space, dimension, physicality. Everything that has been created, none of which existed in eternity. Mind-boggling, but that's clearly what the Bible's teaching. God himself does not exist in time. He's not subject to time. He invented time. It did not exist before he created it. Eternity is not marked by time. It commenced with the physical realm in Genesis 1. Our brethren that try to put a gap in between, uh, what, verse 1 and 2 or 2 and 3, the gap theory, uh, have, have misconstrued what's going on here. So God and the Word, according to John 1, 1, God and Jesus, God the Father and God the Son, coexisted in eternity prior to the onset of time. So for as long as Yahweh, Jehovah, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, for as long as they have existed, that's how long Jesus has existed. And that has been forever, which cannot be said of anyone else. Only deity. I think we have time for uh, a little further elaboration on this chapter 1, verse 1. Here is the uh, New World Translation on this. Of course, you're familiar with this uh, infamous rendering 
in the beginning was the Word, in the beginning the Word was, the Word was with God, and the Word was a little g God. And of course there is absolutely no justification to render, that, render it that way. In fact, it is uh, grammatically, linguistically incorrect. In fact, it promotes polytheism. You're not multiple gods. The Bible teaches from beginning to end there's just one. And so all the gods of Hinduism are imaginary. Baal, Dagon, Asherah, all of those in the Old Testament. They were figments of human imagination. There's no substance to that. They don't actually exist. All of the, all of the gods of Greece and, and uh, Rome, none of it's real. In Greek, definite predicate nouns which precede the verb are regularly anarthrous. That is, they do not have an article. So they make a big thing about putting a instead of the. Here's the terminology in the original. And God was the word. All right? What's the definite predicate now? I'm sorry to put you through this, but I want to convince you that this is ungetoverable. You ought to put this in front of, at your desk, I mean, at your door and pull it out and uh, whenever they come to the door and show them. A definite predicate now. Well, what is the verb in this sentence? Was. Okay, so we would expect the definite predicate noun to lack the article. And it does. But that doesn't mean it's a god. That's linguistically indefensible. And therefore, you know, Christendom can have a lot of wacky things, I recognize. But I go to, what is it, BibleGateway.com. I use that regularly because they have about 60 English translations that you, can, you have access to. So you can type in one verse, and it'll give you that, the rendering of that verse in all of those translations. You're not going to find one that says, a hey, God. Only the New World Translation. And it, I mean, come on, even on the face of that. That's bias. And when the Greek scholars got a hold of that, when that came out back in the 60s, 59, 60, you know, they just tore it to shreds, said there is no justification. Who is it that translated it, translated your translation for you? And they won't, to this day, they won't tell. All right, is our time up? It is. Anybody want to make any comments or say anything before we... Shut this down. I'm going to give you a number of other passages that point to the de deity of Christ. Conrad? You mentioned about the statement itself, you know, knowing, recognizing Jesus as God, and that was evident in his invitation. When he said over and over again, if you are the Son of God, that's just basically saying you're claiming that. So, yeah. of course, he knew he was. It's just a challenge there. In fact, remember the construction on those first two challenges. If should be translated since. It's not like Satan doesn't know that he is. That's not what he was challenging. He was just trying to subvert him. But the third time, he, he goes with the, if, if, if you were to bow down and worship me, which was not very certain at all. Good. Any other thoughts?
number 37. 37 will be our song of encouragement. Tom will have some words of exhortation for us, and Conrad will lead us in a closing prayer. Ed is in uh, ICU or struggling to come over past his uh, surgery, and Lynn is at home with uh, two different uh, items that are disturbing her physical health, so we always need to remember these additions to our list in the bulletin. The latest retreat starts this Friday. Any of you ladies have any questions, you need to talk to Julie or Carol Leah. Okay, Tom. Let me invite you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're going to look at a couple of verses toward the close of that chapter. There are two predominant uh, religious theories that seem to have captivated the religious world. One of these is premillennialism, which advocates a kingdom on earth, that somehow or some way that when Jesus comes again, he's going to establish an earthly kingdom and rule in Jerusalem or depending on your religion, maybe some other major city. The other religion that seems to have captivated the thinking of the world is John Calvin's doctrine and his theology. And you no doubt have heard it said on a number of occasions that you can identify John Calvin's doctrine with five letters that actually spell the word tulip. So let me look at these for just a minute. The letter T suggests total depravity which means that man cannot make any choices. He is born into this world as a sinner rather than being born as an innocent individual who then later goes astray, total depravity. The second letter is the letter U, and that refers to unlimited salvation or unlimited grace. And uh, no, but first unconditional salvation, I'm sorry, unconditional salvation, which suggests that uh, man uh, can be saved by faith only or grace only, but there's no responsibility that man has. So you suggest unconditional salvation. And then you have the letter L, and that is limited atonement, that God selects arbitrarily those who are going to be saved and those who are going to be lost. And so it's limited, salvation is limited to that little group that God has arbitrarily selected by saying one man's going to be saved and the next man's going to be lost. And then you have the letter I, which refers to irresistible grace. That means if man is born totally depraved and if salvation is unconditional, then how is man going to be saved? And that is that God in his grace is going to impact the heart of man and those who are the elect cannot resist it and so you have uh, irresistible grace and then you have the last letter which is p which is preservation of the saints which we sometimes refer to as the once saved always saved doctrine now there is one element that runs like a fine thread all the way through the scriptures that crosses paths with John Calvin's doctrine at every single plank. And that element is expressed in Deuteronomy chapter 30. I want you to start reading with me at verse 19, and let's just read two or three verses as the chapter comes to a close. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before thee life and death the blessing and the curse, and therefore choose life that thou mayest live, thou and thy seed, to love Jehovah thy God, to obey his voice, and to cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which Jehovah swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give to them. You see, the power of man to choose crosses paths with John Calvin's theology at every plank. Take, for example, total depravity that says man is born into this world a sinner. Does man not lose his power of choice? 
Take the second, which is uh, the letter U, which refers to unconditional salvation, which simply says that man has to do nothing in order to be saved. Well, he's taken the choice away from him. All man has to do then is believe, and in some radical situations, they say man doesn't even need to believe because God's grace is unconditional. What about limited atonement that says one man is saved and the next man is lost? Where does choice come into that aspect? Then you have irresistible grace. And again, you rob man of his choice. And then the last one, preservation or perseverance of the saints, which says once saved, always saved. And men would even go so far as to say it makes no difference what you do once you become a Christian, that not any of your sins, any of your actions can ever cause you to lose your soul. So you see, choice crosses paths with John Calvin's doctrine at every single plank. Now I'm going to share with you an interesting story in my life in which I was studying with a young man, college age, and he was a Catholic, and I was trying to convince him of the need to be baptized into Christ. He was convinced that when he was young and baptized as a baby, that all those sins had been removed, and therefore he stood justified in God's sight. The young man was single, and on occasions we would have some casual conversation, and he would say something to the effect, I would love to find a wife. So I made this proposition to him. I said, I'll tell you what, if you will give me the keys to your house, then late one night I'm going to come in with a beautiful woman, and we're going to come to your bedside, and she's going to take her vows very quietly. We're not going to wake you up. And she's going to promise to be loyal to you, and then she's going to say, I do. And the moment that I wake you up, as soon as I wake you up, I will say the vows, and then I want you to say, I do. And he said, that's crazy. He said, I don't have any choice in the matter. And I just looked at him, and it dawned on him, the relationship. You see, when we obey the gospel, we are added to the bride of Christ. The man saw the error of his way, and not too far, not too many days after that, he was baptized into Christ. And so here we are in our generation, in our day and age, and we have the gospel that's preached to us, we have God's call for us to come to him, either in initial obedience or coming back to him if we've wandered away. But it boils down to this one element, and that is choice. And so I use the words of Moses to encourage you tonight. If you have need to respond to the gospel, or if you have a need for the prayers of the church, then choose life as together we stand and as we sing.
together. Our Father in heaven, we are exceedingly uh, thankful for Jesus and all that was done on our behalf. We're thankful that you gave us the choice when you made us to do right or wrong. We pray that we will always choose the right path, uh, knowing that it leads to eternal life with you. We pray for all those that are represented here tonight, all those families that are here, and a few that are not with us due to sickness or other problems. Take care of them. Help us the rest of this week as we face temptations on every side to, to battle these temptations with your word, as Christ did, that we may overcome with your help. Help us each moment of each day as we struggle. And please forgive us if we have... Uh, stumbled and fallen, help us to get up, and uh, please continue to wash away our sins as we walk in the light. We are so thankful for life and for your great power and love for us. For it's through Christ's name we pray, amen.